Hello. Hello. <laughs> Please feel free to introduce yourself, your job title, and what it is that you do. Sure. So my name is Katie Slayball. I am the therapist on our military inpatient unit at John Randolph Medical Center. And I also have the opportunity to help out on our civilian inpatient unit as well as our outpatient mental health unit. Nice. So what age range would you say you work with the most? So we um, mainly work with adults. So anywhere between the ages of 18 to 60, 70 years old, depending on what um, age the patient is, but it's strictly adults. Okay. So among the people that you meet with, would you say there's a stigma regarding mental health? Yes. 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 Okay. So uh, have you noticed any attempts or methods to break this stigma within the hospital? So a lot of people that um, struggle with mental health feel like they are alone in their mental health. Um, they're the only ones that experience anxiety, depression, and so that's why they don't talk about it because they feel so alone. Um, but in order to kind of break the stigma, I facilitate groups that kind of talk about labels and stigma and how can we break those down. So what does that look like? Is it educating our family, our friends, what we're experiencing and that it's okay? Is it advocating on a higher level for mental health? Um, but I think the first step is acknowledging the struggle with mental health and seeking help and educating those around you. But sometimes, you know, we don't even know what we're experiencing, so we don't know how to verbalize it. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's a lot about kind of educating yourself and then educating those around you who are your support systems. That sounds great. So for the people that you work with, how has the pandemic affected their daily routines? Sure. So um, for my specific population, the military population that I work with, um, a lot of them that come from um, basic training or from, from straight from maybe they had a break at home, they have to go through a quarantine period. So it's, I think, I believe it's a 14 day period where they stay in their rooms. Um, and so they get bored, they get in their thoughts. Um, and then for civilians, they don't see their family or friends and coping skills or events that they normally go to out and about and do are kind of stripped from them so they feel even more alone and turn to substances. So before the pandemic, how many patients would you say you saw on a daily basis? So my unit holds eight patients and our civilian unit holds 32 patients. Um, so the pandemic, honestly, we've probably seen um, maybe a slight increase, but again, we go through periods where maybe our census is lower and then it spikes up again. Um, but I do conduct groups daily. So I see whoever's on the unit, that's who I see. So it could be eight patients or it could be four. It just depends on what's on our unit. And then the civilian side, um, we can house 32, but um, I think we have... Um, broken that down to only taking 27 due to COVID to space out more. Okay. So what issue did you see the most of when working with them or issues? Sure. So a lot of our patients on the military unit struggle with anxiety, depression, self-harming behaviors, suicidal thoughts. Um, a lot of them have had previous mental health history before joining the military. So it's kind of following them and they thought that they could join the military and it would be gone, but just changing the environment sometimes doesn't always work. Um, so that's what we kind of are seeing a lot of is the anxiety, depression, self-harming behaviors and the suicidal thoughts and attempts. So has the pandemic affected the amount of patients that you see and the types of issues that they come to you with? So I don't, I think it's the same issues, but I think that it is people are coping with it differently. Um, and I think that, you know, a lot we see job loss because of COVID. We see um, financial loss because of COVID, which adds to the anxiety and the depression. So it's still the same mental health issues. The root or the trigger of it is probably different because of COVID and the pandemic. So when your patients come to you, what process can they expect to undergo to address the problems that they're having? Sure. 
So when they come to us, um, I can I sit down with each patient and conduct a biopsychosocial assessment. Mm -hmm. So just asking them basic questions about what's been going on that led you to come into the hospital, getting some background information, um, and then meet with the psychiatrist every day. And while they're in treatment, they will attend group therapy. So every single day, it's a structured schedule. So they attend um, two groups with myself, two groups with our recreation therapists on staff, mm -hmm. the nurses and the techs. And then if needed, some people don't like mm -hmm. to attend groups or open up in groups. So um, it can provide individual therapy as well. Okay. Oh. So... What are some general steps that people or your patients can take to improve the condition of their mental health no matter the problem? Sure. So I would say that every patient that comes in here creates a safety plan. So the safety plan includes identifying what triggers them, identifying the warning signs, and identifying coping skills and support that helps them. So I think if you are aware of what triggers you and you can identify how that triggers you, what warning signs, which are physical thoughts, sensations, or behaviors you display, identifying it from the beginning rather than kind of letting it go down that rabbit hole of more warning signs that become more severe, like suicide and self-harming and substance use. So you, you mentioned coping mechanisms. What coping mechanisms do you recommend your patients use to deal with the negative emotional effects of a pandemic? Sure. So a lot of patients we see their coping skills are stripped from them because they can't go to concerts. They can't just go see family and friends. They can't go to a restaurant and have dinner. So we try to really teach coping skills that they can do anywhere at any time. So these can include breathing techniques. There's multiple breathing techniques that are out there that you can do. And that allows um, you to help help stay calm. It lowers your heart rate. It lowers blood pressure, all of that. Um, and also being mindful, practicing mindfulness and grounding. So a lot of times when we're anxious or depressed or struggling with our mental health, we're thinking about what happened in the past. We're thinking about what's going to happen in the future. Where if we're mindful and grounding, we are focused on the present. What's going on now? What is going on with me right here in the present? And so using our five senses to do that, what what can I see? What can I touch? What can I smell? What can I hear? And so really focusing on the here and now rather than the past or the future that we can't control right now. Wow. Okay. That was, that was great. <laughs> okay. What are some warning signs of onset mental health issues that others and I can work to recognize in people close to us? Sure. So a warning sign you know, we identify those when we do safety planning. Mm -hmm. And a warning sign is how you respond to the trigger. So it could be physical sensations, behaviors, or thoughts. And so being able to kind of pinpoint a warning sign is difficult for each person because each person has their own warning signs. Right. So I would say, you know, just be aware of what your warning signs are. And if you have a loved one, a family member, or a friend, and you see a, maybe a warning sign, like they're isolating or they're not sleeping, they're not taking care of themselves, um, they're crying, uh, their appetite has increased or decreased. Some of those um, main ones are ones to look out for, things that you no you notice are off or different, um, and it's affecting your friend or family member. So just kind of knowing what, what to look out for, so like knowing what... Um, maybe something different that they don't normally do. Like drastic changes in behavior? Yes. Okay. So if some people dress up nice and do their hair and shower and maybe they came to school dressed down and looked kind of disheveled, maybe something's going on that they don't have motivation to take care of themselves. All right, last question. So a lot of the high school students at Thomas Dale, when they graduate, they may go straight into the workforce mm -hmm. or civilian life. So what are some self-care practices that they can implement now and start practicing that will prepare them for life after high school? Yes. So I fully recommend putting self-care practices into place. Mm -hmm. Taking care of yourself is very, very important. Mm -hmm. 
I recommend having my patients find self-care activities that they can do daily, weekly, and monthly. So daily, you know, those things about hygiene, maybe exercising, um, weekly, reaching out to a friend, going out for dinner, going for a walk, uh, monthly, getting your hair done, getting a manicure, a pedicure, a massage, something that you can put into place um, to take care of yourself and really make a routine with it. Um, I tell my patients, you know, coping skills and self-care, I would give analogy like football. So football teams, the football coach gives their players a playbook and they don't say study play X, Y, and Z. We've got a game in a week. Study those, read over it, and we're going to put those into play. They have to go practice them. They modify them. What works for them makes changes. And that's what you want to do with your self-care and coping skills. Practice them every single day and modify them to work for you. And then your game is that stressful moment. Your game is that crisis moment, the depressive symptoms that come. And the coping skills and self-care techniques come naturally. Right. I really like that analogy. Thank you. That was great. <laughs> that was the last question. Thank you so much yeah, for you're taking welcome. time out. To Thank be you with for me. Um, having me and asking me the question. One more thing. Sure. So, would you mind providing some resources that you like give to your patients so I can disperse them? Sure. To my, yeah. My age grade. So, one resource that I do tell my patients to put on their safety plan is the NAMI. So, it's N A. M I, and that stands for National Alliance of Mental Illness, mm -hmm. and they have a text phone number because nowadays people like to text and they don't like to call. So the number is 741-741, and if you text that number, you'll be connected to a counselor, and a counselor will text you back. And it's free. And it's free for anybody. Huh. And I have tried it, and I got yelled at because I took away from somebody in crisis because I was testing it out. So it does work. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. How is it? Do you mind shaking my hand? Do you want an elbow? Bump? Oh, yeah. We can shake hands. Okay. Thank you so much Thank for you. being with me today. Okay. That's it. Awesome.